Greetings. We're going to be talking about objects and introducing them in Python. So one of the key things we want to learn about is what is object-oriented programming, what are attributes versus methods, how do we instantiate classes, um, and then what, what does this actually mean in a real-world situation. So a lot of new ideas, but we'll work through them slowly and introduce them all. What is really the main thing that we want to accomplish by talking about objects? What's the key takeaway that you should have here? We've been talking about variables all, all semester. We've done things like lists and strings and ints and dictionaries. These were created by the people that wrote Python. These are variable containers for storing different pieces of data. They're really useful, but they don't work in every possible situation. Sometimes we want more custom things, like we might want a variable that represents a dog or a color or a song. What would be the characteristics of a student or of a song? We might have other things than just text in a string or numbers, for example. This is where we get into this idea of object-oriented programming. You would just say this OOP, by the way. So object-oriented programming is a different way of thinking about programming. This is a basically modern way of building software that is how almost every piece of software we use is probably designed. And the core building block is what we call a software object or just an object. And so when we're programming with objects, that's why we call it object-oriented programming. So Python itself is actually object-oriented, meaning it uses objects in design. We've called lists and strings and dictionaries and things like that, we've called them containers or variable types, and those are true, but technically speaking, they're, drumroll, actually objects, okay? Now, objects are made up of attributes or variables. They also provide us with methods or actions that we could do something with. We'll unpack these both in a second. So just to see what this looks like, when we see something like um, the, a list, for example, here we've got list.sort, so sort is a function. It's a it's a what we call a method. It's part of an object. It does something. But at the same time, the list also stores horse and cat. So you can see that it's storing information. We'd call that an attribute, and it can actually perform an action or like sort. Similarly, the string can have the text hello world, or it can also perform an action like dot lower. Just to give you some examples of a real life object. We can use this OOP approach to represent a real life object in software. So let's say you wanna have a checking account or a spacecraft or a person or a house or a fruit or whatever it is you wanna represent that can be, you can easily represent it with a software object. But objects aren't limited to real things in software. We can use it to represent, again, colors or shapes or words or things that are not concrete. So like a real life object, a software object is basically a container that provides you the ability to have what we call characteristics and behaviors, or attributes and methods, or basically some sort of storage of data and then some kind of action. So to see this in, in play out, consider a vehicle like a car, automobile. Imagine for a second, what attributes does a vehicle have? For example, what facts would you want to store about a vehicle? Then take a second and say, okay, what kind of things can a, can a car do? What kind of things can a vehicle do? We call these behaviors, right? Now, we don't often think of a car performing an action on itself, but we could say, you know, could a person do in a car, for example? Okay, so if we want to see, just to give you some ideas, if we're looking at attributes or facts about cars, we might say that you would store how many wheels the car has, right? Could be a motorcycle, for example, um, or maybe it's got 18 wheels or something. It can have the color, the make, the model. These are facts about a car, information that you'd want to store to represent a car in software. Now, if you're designing a car, maybe even in a video game, for example, these are things a car could do, actions a car could take. You could accelerate or decelerate or honk a horn or turn right or turn left. And then there's some other ones listed there as well, right? That maybe you wouldn't use in a video game, but you kind of get the idea. Now, if we define a vehicle in this way, 
this is just sort of the template. We can then go on to create multiple vehicles that fill this these uh, attributes. So one vehicle object, for example, like a real world example, could be this is the Luigi car. It's got four wheels, it's got a license plate, says Luigi, 18 gallons of fuel. Another thing that it can do is it has these actions that can accelerate, decelerate, get more gas. Now, this is another example of a vehicle, right? It's got the same attributes. It has a certain number of wheels, has a certain license plate, different values than the other car, but nevertheless, it's got the same category of options. We call those the same attributes, okay? Again, all these kinds of vehicles, in this case, all these different Batmobiles, could be represented by our vehicle class, even though they are different. Now, how does this translate into actual software? Well, in Python, we say that an object is instantiated from a class. That just means that an object is what we call the realization or sort of the real world example of a class. Programmers can then create many objects from a class. Each object, or what we call an instance, will have the same general structure because it's all built on the same class. You can think of a class like a blueprint. The class is not an object, and this is a really tricky thing. The class is not an object, it is the design for an object. It's kind of like the code, the blueprint, that sets up what are the attributes, meaning the, the pieces of data, and what are the behaviors or methods or actions that it can perform. A really good analogy is to think of the following. A class is a cookie cutter. It defines the structure and outlines and general feeling of what a class is going to look like. But an object or an instance are the actual cookies. So you can see on the left we have the template for a cookie, but we don't have any cookies. But on the right we have the actual delicious animal cracker cookies that are there. This is a very loose analogy. I don't want to take it too far, but you can think of it like this. When we talk about functions, we, we say that we define the function, which is kind of like a general idea of what that's going to do, but nothing actually happens until we call it. Okay, so there's the define and the call. You can kind of think of defining a class as similar to instantiating an object. You can define it, but you haven't created any actual objects. It's only when you then instantiate it that you are able to see examples of it in your program. Now, when you set out to define a class, kind of ask yourself, does it make sense to use objects? Do I even need them? If you do, you want to then consider what sort of attributes and methods might you need. And this can be, if it's a real world example, that's more obvious. If it's not, it can be a little bit trickier to think about. But it really helps you in designing what your object is going to do in your program.